This is Reading Reveries and I am your host Kasturi. You and I together will lose ourselves in a little bit of reading for the next few minutes. We've been talking an awful lot lately about nightstands and reading corners and workstations at home, which led me to pick up this absolutely bitingly hilarious little piece about the do's and don'ts of reading in bed before you turn out the light. It's called Pillow Talk and is written by Oliver Pritchett. Now, Pritchett writes for the Daily Telegraph and the Sunday Telegraph. His is often an oblique look at modernist life, musing bravely on everyday matters, trivial or otherwise. He's brilliantly witty, pricking pretentious balloons. His writings are anthologized in the Telegraph's My Sunday Best, 101 Curious Contemplations on Modern Life, which is illustrated by his famous cartoonist son, Matt Pritchett. Oliver himself is the son to writer and critic V. S. Pritchett, who had the same rare ability to capture the extraordinary strangeness of everyday life. I came across Pillow Talk in the spring 2013 edition of the famous and entirely independent, slightly foxed magazine, The Real Reader's Quarterly, that claims not only to be an indispensable guide to thousands of readers around the world, but a well-read friend to every reader. And if you ask me, it fully lives up to its expectations. They also have a charming podcast of their own and it's called The Slightly Foxed Podcast, meant for adventurous readers, just in case you're interested. So let's get down to today's reading, Pillow Talk by Oliver Pritchett, culled out for you from The Slightly Foxed magazine. Pillow Talk Oliver Pritchett shares some thoughts on the do's and don'ts of reading in bed before he turns out the light. The etiquette of bedtime reading is such a delicate matter that we must approach it on tiptoe. In fact, before we get to the bed, let us pause and consider the bedside table, or more accurately, the pile of books on the bedside table. Our current reading is on the top of the pile, but in the layers below we can find a display of our good intentions, books we have resolved to finish one day. Some of these may even have been there for years. Some perhaps were on the Booker Prize shortlist in 2002. One may be there because of the distant New Year resolution to try Turgenev, say. Another may have been borrowed a shamingly long time ago. There are also some permanent fixtures in this pile, like the incomprehensible instruction manual for the bedside digital clock radio, and also a volume in folkloric ways of predicting the weather, and a copy of weirdest proverbs from around the world, both presents from distant relations at far of Christmases. Rule number one about this pile is, don't show off. Don't leave some dauntingly impressive work on the top just to impress some guest who may stray into the bedroom to leave a coat or to find a paracetamol. Rule number two, don't leave an unfinished book on the bedside table for more than six months. Put it back on the shelves and try again in three months' time. While we are here at the bedside table, I'd like to say something about the bedside light, which is fundamental to any discussion of bedtime reading etiquette. The arrival of the compulsory low-energy light bulb has had a profound effect on the way we read in bed. At first, it led to a mass outbreak of restlessness and lampshade tilting and then to the realisation that the rule book had to be rewritten. What are the proprieties of reading in inadequate light? Two simple rules to start with. 
The first is that it is not good form to attempt to read your heart back by the light of your partner's iPad. The second is that if you choose to wear a head torch or to use one of those neat little lights that clip onto the book itself, it can appear unfriendly and you should remember that reading in bed is best when it is a companionable experience and a shared pleasure. There is, however, a limit to how much pleasure you can share. Try to avoid reading aloud so many passages from your book that you ruin it for your partner when he or she has a turn to reading it. Avoid reading out a witty phrase or a telling observation if it means you will have to take 15 minutes to set the scene with an explanation of the plot and description of the characters involved. When reading Dickens, sipping quick papers, aloud in bed, do not, on any account, attempt to do all the voices. Chuckling is acceptable, provided it is not excessive, and it is a sign of good breeding to explain, as briefly as possible, what is amusing you. The crucial issue in a bedtime reading partnership is timing. That is, the timing of switching out the light. You know what can happen. Just as Phoebe, the long-lost daughter of Lord and Lady Hardcover, is about to reveal the appalling secret of Tome Hall, and as the dashing Octavo Quarter is pulling up his horse in the village of Little Binding, after galloping all night through a thunderstorm to prevent the marriage of Emily and Paper to the unscrupulous Count Fetch Crypt, and exactly at the moment when Mrs. Verso is on the point of realising that the letter from her Australian godson Jason Index is a clever forgery, click, your partner switches out the light. What is the best way of deciding when the lights go out? A simple rule is to say that the person reading the most serious book has the final say. So, for example, Gabriel Garcia Marquez trumps P.G. Woodhouse and Mrs. Gaskell overrules Geoffrey Archer. Great dangers lurk behind those words. Just let me get to the end of this chapter. Sometimes this chapter is the early part of the memoirs of a politician and deals with his childhood with detailed information about how his nanny was a great influence taken in his school days and extremely long school holidays includes its time at oxford and the friends he made a great deal of name dropping here and goes on to describe a period of agonized indecision before he took the plunge into politics because he wanted to change the world for the better By the time we have reached this point in his life, the birds are beginning to clear their throats for the dawn chorus. I suppose it might be possible to agree in advance on the time when the lights will go out, but it's unlikely that both of you will stick to the deadline. There is another complication if your bedtime reading partner is a slammer. This is someone who very suddenly and decisively slams the book shut and in one movement switches off the bedside light, turns over and lurches sideways in the bed, grabbing an extra armful of duvet and crashes off to sleep. The best defence against a slammer is to make sure your bedside reading is a book with short chapters, Michael Train's Wonderful Skios, for example, or a collection of non-epic poems or a volume of pithy letters. Somebody once said, and I think it was me actually, the secret of a happy marriage is a good bookmark. It can never be considered civilised behaviour to engage in competitive bedtime reading, seeing who can get through the most pages, giving frequent sideways glances to keep score and turning pages with a little too much eagerness. There is also a condition known as competitive insomnia. This is a tendency among some couples for both partners to claim to be the worst sleeper. 
This can lead to the use of underhand tactics such as switching on the light at 2.30 a.m. to read another chapter of Middlemarch. These contests should be stopped before they get out of hand and somebody reaches for Gibbon's decline and fall. Of course, switching on the light in the early hours to read a few more pages is acceptable within reason and can be a tactful way of indicating to your partner that he or perish the thought she is snoring. Surely, nobody needs reminding that only a cat reads the newspaper in bed, except first thing in the morning. There has been endless debate about the optimum number of pillows required for two people reading in bed. Various formula have been devised, taking into account the temperature of the room, the weight of the books being read, size of print and angle of bedside light. A simple rule of thumb is that a total of eight pillows is just about adequate and 13 is getting close to a being excessive. As for the way the pillows are shared out, clearly the person with the thickest volume is entitled to the fattest ones and the most. Sometimes I've done without pillows altogether and tried reading while lying flat on my back. This can be dangerous and is not to be recommended with a heavy volume. So it's well worth remembering, uneasy lies the head that reads Wolf Hall in bed. In bed, Oliver Pritchard prefers a hard mattress and a hard pillow to go with his hard back of Dickens's hard times. So, tell me, have you heard of any weird bedtime reading habits or any humorous incidents related to bedtime reading? Come tell me in the comment section below. Also, let me know how you enjoyed this episode. That'll be all for today. Thank you so much for joining in. Be sure to tune in for another episode of Reading Reveries next week. Until then, keep well and have a good day.